everyone. Welcome to another episode of Writer on the Road. Today I have with me a beautiful guest by the name of Amy Andrews. I have looked at Amy's bio online and all I can do is open my mouth and go, wow. Amy, on, on your website you have won every award that could possibly go to a romance writer. And I guess with over a million books sold and over 50 romances, um, that's not such a, such a surprise. Which out of all those um, awards that are on your website, and I could name them but I'd be there for a while, which <laughs> of those awards are you most proud of? Well, I haven't won all of them. Let's just let's just be honest. I haven't won a Rita yet, which is the actual ultimate one, which is the uh, won the Romance Writers of America uh, award every year. So that's kind of one that's on my bucket list. Uh, but I've certainly won the Romance Writers of Australia uh, main award, the Ruby, twice, and that was both of those have been um, probably um, award wise probably the pinnacle um, of my career. But each. Each one's different because each one is usually judged in a different way. So there are so you know there are reader judged. I really like the Ruby because it's reader judged. Um, so people you know readers actually read your book, and they're the ones that decide you know whether they liked it or not. Um, there are more the other ones that are more like popular awards. So it's you know if people like you as an author. Um, so I won quite a few of those, which is obviously lovely as well. So it just it depends that you know they all mean something at the time because writing is such an isolating you know um, career or business or whatever you like to call it. And um, it's nice to know that you know people are are out there appreciating your stuff really. Yeah. Now I came across Annie's uh, sorry Amy's name. Uh, when I moved to the beautiful um, hinterland of Brisbane and I got very excited. I thought, oh, great, there's another romance writer living around the corner. I'll have to go over and have a cup of coffee one day. <laughs> and I, oh, well, I, yeah, I pursued that line of thought thinking, oh, yeah, Amy's there, I'll catch up with her. Um, I looked on your um, website this morning and I got a little bit embarrassed about that presumption because I thought I've published one romance novel and I've got some more that I want to publish and I thought... Are people like us allowed to go and approach the um, infamous writers in our genre? And I'm guessing before I even let Amy come in on this one, the one thing that I've noticed is romance writers are so very, very supportive and open to helping the rest of us. I'm guessing, Amy, when I asked, would you come on my podcast, there was it was a yeah, sure. It wasn't, oh, no, I've got 50 books published and you've got none. How do you? <laughs> yeah, go away and come back when you grow up. Um, what do you get a lot of requests from people who are just totally amazed by you and are a little bit nervous about approaching you? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I suppose mostly you get those kind of requests. Um, you know, you get the other requests for interviews and stuff, which is always really nice. It's nice to have somebody say, "Hey, do you want to come on my podcast?" Um, you could have knocked on my door and introduced yourself, and I might have been a little bit surprised but I would have been I, you know I don't think anybody's beneath me I, you know I think we all start in a particular spot and it takes you know some of us write slower it takes us longer for some so we've all you know got a shared experience that we can talk about and this is a great thing just being with writers is that you know they're the people who really understand you more than anything but I guess I get most exposure to you know other um to readers at conferences and things like that and I like to think and I hope that anybody can uh, approach me and I can have a good chat I actually really quite an ex I'm quite an extrovert I'm a bit different to a lot of writers who are quite introverted I'm quite comfortable in a room full of people I don't know my husband always says I can talk the leg off an iron pot I'm kind of the kind of person who can go to a wedding you know you often sometimes you go to weddings or something like that where you don't really know anybody and you're sitting at a bunch of a table with people that you don't know well it takes me half an hour to work out who everyone is and what they do and you know I'm quite good at chatting with people about things and at particularly at writers conferences so a lot of people will say, particularly I guess if you're introverted, I didn't really have a good time at that conference or that thing because nobody spoke to me, you know. So they're frightened to, too frightened to kind of speak out themselves because, they're, you know, they're introverted. It's quite overwhelming to be in a room full of like, you know, 300 women all gabbling at each other. But we all have such a thing in common at those things. The easiest, way, the easiest thing to do is to go up to somebody and say, hello, my name is, what do you write? And then... Usually you don't have to say anything else because everyone wants to talk about their writing, so it's a really easy thing to do. 
Yeah, and we've got the Romance Writers of Australia uh, National Conference coming up in Adelaide. No, I think I'm so excited. Yes, and there's a lot of um, people on Facebook getting their hair done for the occasion. And Yes, I got mine done um, <laughs> the other day. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's exciting and I wish I could be there to um, broadcast Oh, you're not coming? I didn't get organised in time. Um, that'll be the story of my life, but I'll definitely be here in <laughs> Brisbane next year. Yeah, it's great uh, that it's in Brisbane next year. Yeah, I had this fantasy, um, especially for my listeners who, are very keen and very interested in our Australian romance authors, I thought I would ask you all to get in a room and um, talk to me on the phone for half an hour about your experiences down there. But then I realised you'd all be down there having fun and partying and drinking champagne and the last thing you want to do is have a telephone call (laughs) from me. So I thought... (laughs) Also, there's hardly ever a place you can get that's quiet enough to talk um, on a telephone for any length of time. There's so much kind of background noise going on it's hard to hear yourself think I always leave conferences with no voice yeah and um, that's something I I attended my first Romance Writers of Australia conference that was in Sydney at uh, Brighton Le Sands and I'd come down from Darwin especially for that conference and I was just blown away it was so exciting and I think Nora Roberts was at that conference Mm, mm. Um, and that's how long it was I missed that conference that's one of the conferences I didn't go to Mm. yeah well I emailed um Nora Roberts the other day and I said look I was at a conference with you a few years ago like about 20 um how about coming <laughs> how about coming on my podcast and I got an um email back from her publisher saying I'm sorry she's too busy and I went oh could you just ask her because I'm sure that she would <laughs> yeah okay um I just want to focus on my listeners for a moment um Amy if if any of you out there Uh, thinking about writing a novel and you're keen to work out how it happens and everything, these writers' conferences are your first step, I would suggest, to finding out a little bit about uh, the genre, um, what the expectations are, who the people who are writing and reaching out to others for support. Is, Is that a good piece of advice, Amy? Uh, I think it's their a step. I don't necessarily think they're a first step because I think there's, you know, they only swing around once a year, and I think there are a lot of things that people can do, um, you know, outside of that as well. Um, obviously, joining Romance Writers of Australia to start with, if you're, you know, if you're writing romance or whatever you're writing, always join your peak body. That you know, they're there to support you. So that I would, I always recommend people, you know. Romance Writers, particularly to join Romance Writers of Australia, I certainly wouldn't be published without them, I have absolutely no doubt. And so with that comes a whole bunch of other support systems then that you can put in place before you go to a conference. It can kind of gear you up, if you know what I mean, you know, prior to that. I always recommend uh, that people... Uh, particularly, like say, with Romance Writers Australia, they do lots of online courses and things like that as well. They've got um, chat rooms and support groups that you can, you know, um, you can click into. They've got their um, monthly newsletter uh, that's always very informative. Uh, they have avenues that um, connect you with other writers in your area. I always think it's a really good thing to join a local uh, writing group or like uh, critique group. Um, if you can, if you have people in that area and Romance Rise Australia, you know, can let you know whether that's the case. Um, as long as you always, my one thing I say to people is make sure you always only ever get your work critiqued by people who are reading and writing in that particular genre. There's no point giving your romance novel to a poet because they won't understand the conventions of, you know, the, of, the genre so and vice versa there's no point you know if, if you're a poet giving it to you know a science fiction writer or whatever the people you really have to get the right I always say it's important to get you know good good critique from beta readers and stuff but make sure those people know what they're you know are familiar with the genre um so I think there's lots of little and there's lots of great um you know how to craft books out there as well which are also um you know quite helpful Uh, on your journey as well. So I think there's, I know when I've sort of, after I first got my first rejection and I realised I didn't know everything and I wasn't wonderful and I wasn't going to be instantly rich, that my, I was like, okay, so I don't know everything. So what can I do now? Where can I go? I have, there has to be a support group. There has to be something I can do. And I actively took steps to connect with people who could help me, um, who were in the sort of same situation as me. I call it serving my apprenticeship, which was actually 12 years. It took me 12 years to get published from my first rejection to being picked up. So it can be a long time in the wilderness. I mean, certainly the publishing landscape's changed in that time as well. So it's, you know, different now, but um, 
yeah, I think there's lots of things you can do, but certainly going to conferences and things like that are just so wonderfully motivated. They're motivating. You come away, I mean, you come away exhausted, but you also come away so um, keen to write, so full of ideas, so connected to other people so excited they're just such a and then you've and you've just feel like you've you know you feel like you're with your tribe you feel like yeah you know people who understand when you talk about voices in your head and stuff they're the people that you know know what you're talking about so they're wonderful oh i i never i never miss a romance writers of australia conference it's that's my one thing a year that i that i have to go to yeah, and, th- and that's why we're talking about it at the moment, everyone, because it is coming up very, very shortly. And there'll be lots of things that come out of that conference. Um, they usually have editors there and um, agents who are looking to yeah. publish yeah. if you choose to go that route. I know a lot of us now are proud to be indie authors, and it's one of the things I want to talk about with Amy today. But as I'm um, reading her biography here, when if we look at that traditional and indie um, publishing dictomy. We've Annie's been. Oh, sorry, I keep saying Annie because I you interviewed Annie's her last, last week, yes, and now I've got I Amy this week. And Annie keeps popping up on our um, Facebook feed, everybody from all these wonderful places over in um, Scotland You're, and America. I and know just, um, she's over there at the moment, isn't she? Yeah, I think we should be there. So I apologise, and I wish I could edit it out and we could start again. So I apologise, Amy. Um, the pub, um, the publishers that Amy's got on her website are Harlequin Mills and Boone. Uh, Entangled, Harper Collins, Momentum, Tool, and Escape. Uh, over a million books and translated into 13 different languages, including manga. We'll touch mm-hmm. on manga in a moment because that was quite intriguing to me. Um, you've had so many different publishers. Uh, who are you with at the moment? Uh, at the moment, I still write some um, medical romance for Harlequin, Mills and Boone. I'm only doing, I do about a book a year for them. Uh, I am doing most of my writing for Entangled and for Thule, uh Publishing at the moment. Uh, and I've got a couple of books with Escape as well. So mainly three main publishers uh, and then I do the odd little bit of thing here and there for for others. Yeah, and um, it's interesting because when I was um, researching for this interview this morning, I came across Amy's blog. Now, I'll talk to you about that later, Amy, because once I found it and then I lost it again straight away and I can't bring the rotten thing up again, so you're going to have to tell me where to find it. Um, it's not on your main author page, which is interesting in itself. Um, my my blog? I what do you mean? Did you have a blog last year or a few years ago? No, I've never had a personal blog. I blog at regularly at... A couple of different sites, but I, um, I just don't feel like I could give a blog enough. I think if you're going to blog, then you should do it regularly, and so I f- would find it difficult to do that because I'm busy doing other things, and so I've never actually committed to my own personal blog. But I do blog at a couple of. I blog at the um, Lovers of Best Medicine, uh, the medical authors blog, and I blog at the Love Cats as well. So. Ah, that's that. I probably brought one of those up, and that's why Might I couldn't be, find yeah. it. Yeah, and it said something about. Um, do you track your sales? Um, have you had dips and all that kind of stuff in your sales? Was did you have a major dip there last year, and then things picked up again, or you don't look at it? You don't look at the analytics set closely. Well, because I'm not indie published, I'm not actually privy to. Um, you know, a lot of the day-to-day figures that indie mm-hmm. published people, you know, are. Yep. Um, so I really have to rely on my publishing, my publishers, um, you know, royalty statements that I get. A lot of them aren't particularly detailed. So um, I don't really – I try not to <laughs> track sales or become too obsessed with um, rankings on Amazon and stuff like that. Trying being the operative word because sometimes, you know, particularly after a book just first releases, it's a little bit hard not to become, you know, completely obsessed with it and like, you know, just kit F5, 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 F5 all day. Um, but yeah, no, I, I try to just kind of look at big picture and let the sort of, you know, my publishers deal with selling the book. And doing my bit, of course, because, you know, all publishers these days demand that you do your bit of social media and, you know, to augment. Um, but I try not to become too obsessed <laughs> with it. <laughs> try. <laughs> okay. And um, I believe you're a very organised 
um, with your time and that you are a very, very busy lady. Uh, now, I noticed in one of our um, exchanges that you said, oh, I'll get to that once I've done my daily word count. Yes. <laughs> I try I try to set oh, – because I've actually just finished a book. So I was really – and I was really running overdue over time with it. So I was trying to be very disciplined with it. Uh, when I'm writing, I tend to write – I try to write 3K a day. Uh, and that usually takes me sort of most of the day, I suppose. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty disciplined with that. I can, I can do it mostly. I'd like to write less. I've gone from really writing quite high volumes in my past, like you know, sort of five k a day. And like on uh, Thursday, I finished my book at half past twelve, at half past midnight on Thursday night, Friday morning. And I think I wrote about six thousand words, sort of to get that book done that sort of after that day that probably took me probably eight hours or something uh but I do when I'm writing I do try to set a word count and meet it and make it because it's my job yeah it's you know, that's that's what I do it's what everybody else who's got a job has to do if they go to work every day they have to sit down at their desk or whatever they do and they've got stuff they have to do that day and they have to do it because it's their job and otherwise I don't get paid well it's the same for me I've got contracts I have to fulfill so it's my job hmm. How do you feel about having those uh, deadlines um, set for you externally? I'm sure you've got some control over them, um, but you don't have any choice. You produce the work on a given day or you're in trouble? Or... Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I, I mean, I, for, you know, as far as having a contract goes, you always have a delivery date, um, but I've never, ever once felt like or – um, really knew that that was set in stone. Mm. Um, things happen in life, and it's okay. You know, I've always, it's always been, you know, the date has to go on the contract because otherwise the contract can't be signed. It's you know, it can't be some airy fairy date. There has to be something down concretely. But um, I've, you know, if you're running late, if things have happened, you can just say, look, I'm not going to get it in. It's due. You know, it's due now. Well, it's due in, in two weeks. So I'm just not. Oh, I just want to have it in. You know, this has happened, or that's happened, or I haven't been able to do that. And and you know, I've found I've never ever had a problem with a publisher who's gone. Well, that's too bad. Never going to write for us ever again. They just go, sure, thanks for letting us know. As long as you have an open, honest dialogue with them. Like uh, I wrote a book with my sister for Harper Collins quite a few, you know, a few years back now. Um, and the second book in the contract was, uh, I think, I mean, due in at the end of August, I think. And our mother died at the end of July or the beginning of July. And there was like, you know, we just couldn't, couldn't even write and didn't even, you know, there was just nothing in us to write for a couple of months. And our publisher was, you know, went, that's fine. Just get it whenever you're okay to write again. Just let us know and we'll, we'll talk about, you know. I think we ended up getting it in October or something like that. So, you know, I've never once found a publisher not be very flexible despite what's on the contract. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I actually rarely, I've rarely hit, uh, I've rarely got a book in before deadline, rarely. So. Yeah, and I think that's the nature of the beast when it comes to deadlines. You don't really start to take them seriously until it was due yesterday and then you go into a mad panic and write, <laughs> write, write quite crazy. They are, certainly, they're very motivating, that's for sure. I think there's, there's the... Um, you know, there's the contracted date that's there, but there's also kind of a date in your head, you know, with things that happen and around that. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that people should take your deadlines, you know, that you shouldn't be serious about your deadline, that you should, you know, be cavalier about it at all. Just an acknowledgement that, you know, a contract that you sign now that's meant for, you know, for a book that you're writing next year is, you know, always going to be a bit of guesswork and as far as, when that might come in. So um, it's always, of course, important to be professional and try and meet your deadlines. Uh, and if you can't, to have an open dialogue with your, you know, your publisher, your editor about, you know, what's happening and when it might possibly be coming in. I mean, I've never done anything like be a year or two years over <laughs> over date. Like some people <laughs> I know are. Um, but, yeah, I think as long as there's open communication with your editor, then... It, I, it would, I, I don't think I'd be comfortable being with a publisher that, you know, was militant about this, you know, this way, 
or not, you know, or that way, the highway kind of thing. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, as an indie publisher, I had um, Joanne Dannon on a few weeks ago and she's very self-motivated and very, very keen and works with a lot of enthusiasm and she manages everything herself and and is making, um, I think, quite a big impact um, with her readers. And then on the other side of the coin, you've got yourself who's been at this for a number of years and you have those contracts and those deadlines coming in. Um, What do you see as the biggest change in publishing in the last few years um, as you as you've um, become more and more involved oh definitely you know the rise of digital publishing has been the biggest thing that's changed you know it's just changed everything uh, digital slash indie publishing self-publishing is just um, you know that's the whole digital disruption isn't it? it happened in the it happened in the music industry and uh, you know then it kind of flipped over and um, it's happening in the um, in the publishing world um, it's not a not a bad thing necessarily at all. It's just what it is, and um, I think there's been a lot of turbulence, a lot of people that have you know coming from a tr- traditional publishing background, you know, having to kind of navigate those new waters. Um, and I think this is the thing people talk about, you know, being indie um, published, but I think even traditionally published people these days are, are hybrid you know, authors because we all have digital, um, you know, copies of our books as well that are available online and overseas and we're all required to do a lot of different um, online social media stuff as well. So um, it's not just really about here's my book, it's out on a shelf um, and then that's it because, you know, they're all of our books are have digital copies as well out as out there as well. So we kind of, whether we wanted to or not, you know, there's a lot, might have been a lot of resistance from a lot of people, but, you know, we still have to operate, we have to operate in that digital space as well because a lot of our readers will come, especially, um, you know, if your book's only print published in Australia, but it's online, well, a lot of your readers are, pub- are going to come from overseas via the digital medium. So uh, it's important to be able to connect with those readers as well. Yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting one. I had a newsletter from Barbara Freethy this morning, who's probably the queen of independent independent publishing, mm-hmm. or one of the queens. Um, if there's someone else out there, I apologise. Uh, yeah, and her newest book came through, and it's book three of a series or something like that. And I was very excited, and I immediately bought that. Uh, I didn't have to go anywhere. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to look on Amazon. It was just there for me. And um, once upon a time, you know, Nora Roberts was my queen and I could just click buy. Um, But now we've got some of these new indie authors coming through. When it comes to prices, um, I can pretty much tell straight away whether the e-book's being priced by a publisher or whether it's being priced by an indie author, (laughs) um, which is a bit scary. Um, And I I tend to steer away from, you know, $7 and $8 e-books because I know it doesn't what he does because yeah. it's a ridiculous price to pay for an ebook. Yeah. Do you think mm. um, the traditional publishers are starting to work that out and they'll start to meet the market? I think that so in Australia we're always five years behind what everybody else is doing, you know, in publishing. So <laughs> whatever's happening like in America, it'll take our publishers like another five years or whatever to kind of do the same thing. I think publishers are pricing their ebooks more realistically now but I still believe that print publishers will do everything to protect their print market so uh, they they will price their ebooks ridiculously high and which is like um, a shame I, the book number that I wrote with my another book that I wrote with my sister just recently that mirror Australia published um, so you can get it in big W for like you know sixteen dollars uh, although it's recommended retail price I think is 24.95 and I think you can get it online for twelve dollars well you know nobody's gonna buy I mean maybe people who really like my writing might buy it online for twelve dollars. But nobody who's coming to me for the first time is going to buy it for twelve dollars. They're not going to take a risk on that, and I don't blame them for it. You know, not when you can buy, you know, another great book for ninety nine cents or two ninety nine. So um, that's it's a frust it's a frustrating thing for <laughs> all of us uh, in that space. Um, but you know, and I don't really think traditional publishers are ever going to have books as low as digital slash indie publishers price their 
books, not, not, not ones that are out in print as well. Uh, I don't think that they will eventually come down to a more kind of, you know, under $10 kind of mark eventually. Yeah. I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's a difficult one because um, I think I heard one of the statistics was there was 90,000 free ebooks out there at the moment and you know people are still using that free to bring in readers um the first book in a series apparently is still very effective as a free yeah i've got a first book one of my Tuli series that i've got my first book's free in it and has been free for you know quite a few months and it will be perma free it's perma free it's always going to be free so uh and you know that's worked quite effectively for me to bring people not just to that book but to the rest of the series also to my newsletter uh so uh, yeah i think it is uh i think it is an effective you know it's an effective tool absolutely yeah and as our newsletters everybody i signed up for amy's newsletter this morning as i was passing oh, around there i'm getting more i'm getting um i think i have to set up a mailbox just for my newsletters nowadays <laughs> <laughs> yes um on Amy's website, her latest book is Playing by the Rules and it's a Sydney Smoke rugby novel. Now, I immediately went, oh, my God, it's football. Um, I work uh-huh. in an old boys' school. All we ever talk about is football, football, football. Um, I learnt that the Reds here in Brisbane is a football team, not a basketball team. And <laughs> rugby team, that's right. It's a rugby <laughs> team. I came down from North Queensland where we had this wonderful football team called the Cowboys. Uh, the local newspaper ran with the Cowboys' wives and I'm going, what has happened to our world? And now Amy Andrews has put out a whole series called... Um, <laughs> What is it? A rugby novel. And there's a, I think there's a series of them. I read here on your website somewhere that here it is down the bottom. They're all coming out or the first few are coming out all at once. Or Yeah, yep. they're coming out. So this one came out in July. The next one's coming out in September. And the next one after that's coming out in November. That's one I've just, the November one's one I finished at midnight on Thursday night. Uh, and then next year, there's another five to come out. I'm hoping they'll all come out next year, sort of two months apart next year as well. Um which is, you know, when you're digitally published, this is through Entangled Publishing. So um, you can, you know, you can do things in that space that you can't do traditionally. You know, you can't put out five books next year that you haven't, that haven't even written yet. <laughs> you know? yes. But you can do that digitally. So, um, yes, I actually had pitched to Entangled Publishing uh, the idea of doing uh, kind of like a, a medical series uh, because you know I've I've written like thirty odd medical romances for Harlequin, but not kind of set in hospital, more set around you know the bar opposite the hospital where everybody goes to hang out, kind of that. And they said, oh, we've already got that. And and my editor said, look, we're thinking of doing a rugby series because even though rugby isn't very big in the, not really known in the US, it is. Um, I think probably because of Jared Hayne more than anything else, are becoming quite known in the US. And, you know, so there's a lot of women over there that appreciate the whole rugby, you know, guy. And I said the same thing to her that you said to me. I was like, you could not have possibly picked a worse person in the entire world to ask to write a sports <laughs> book because I'm, I'm not even going to be watching the Olympic Games. I'm just not a sports person at all. But they're offering me my own series. And I was just went, yes, I'm going to take it. It's uh, in their brazen lines. They're quite, um, the heat level on that is quite high. It's sort of my comfort zone. It's where I write. Um, they have very, you know, good marketing and sales. With that, Entangle Publishing do do that really, really well. And I just thought it would be mad to say no to that. And the thing is, it's not like, yes, it's the whole series is set around a, uh, a rugby team, but they're romances, so you know, there always be romances at the core. It's not a lot of rugby. So I mean, I, like I've literally got two guys that I know that are husbands and friends that I text all the time about different things because I don't know about stuff like that. Um, but mostly, it's you know, it's about the romance. Yes, there's some rugby stuff in it, but mostly it's about the romance. So yeah, yeah. and I think um, the rugby um, league here in Australia should actually pay you some um, PR money to lift their image a little bit because it's not very good here at the moment. And I think having women come in and soften that image is probably not such a bad thing. Well, I think this is the thing that um, um, 
and I've put a glossary in the front of um, the books because to explain a lot of these rugbyisms to because you know I guess it'll be largely an American audience that'll be reading it. Uh, so to explain the rugbyisms and the Australianisms in it as well, because this is the thing with Australia with footy in Australia, we have three different codes of footy. Now I'm I'm writing rugby union, but just being on Pinterest, for example, and looking at um, American um, Pinterest users who are who you know have got rugby boards, well, rugby union boards. I know that half the pitches are actually rugby league players. So, you know, there's confusion between, you know, well, that's, you know, you know, it's confusing enough for, you know, somebody who's not really into sports in Australia to understand there's three different codes in Australia. So um, my glossary sort of has set out to help, you know, explain the differences between the codes and um, try to do a bit of education that way. Yeah, and I think one of the things that has set off this interest in sports romance has a lot to do with finding a niche on Amazon because I know when we're looking at SEO and we're looking at Google Analytics and all those kinds of things, the trick is to find a genre within a genre that you may be able to rise to the top very quickly with. So I'm guessing Entangled have come up with these sports romances because they are bandied around on the podcasting um, world at the moment a little bit. So I'm guessing you may have hit on something pretty good. I think that uh, sports romance has always been popular. I did notice on – I know you were talking with Annie Seaton last – in your podcast last about those stats that came out from Data Guy. Um, you guys were talking about that briefly and one of those stats actually said that contemporary romance is still the most popular, um, you know, genre in romance but particularly popular in – I think there was there were three subgenres and one of them was sports romance and I was like yay! <laughs> yes, I'm normally kind of always behind the eight ball with you know being in the on trend kind of you know writing in the on trend thing. So it was nice to know that maybe also you know that sports romance is um, particularly popular at the moment, which is really great. And hopefully the Olympics will only you know help to further that, have a good kick on effect good ripple effect for a while yeah and it sounds to me like entangled i don't i don't know them it's been mentioned by a few of the other authors um and could have been one of those i'm not sure yeah and it's an entangled author well, yeah it's... it seems to be a good boost for romance writers in their careers so everybody out there listening um look up entangled see what they've got to offer because it sounds like they um, know how to market fairly well they do. They really, really do know how to – they've only been around for four years and they've been – I think it's only four years and they've just been a phenomenal success and they really know how to sell romance in the digital space really well. Yeah, I might um, see if I can get someone on to have a chat with us and explore that um, further. As much as I didn't want my podcast to become romance focused um, because it's my interest and because you guys are all generous and because we're chatting anyway, I'm guessing that that may become a little bit area of um, interest to all of us. I noticed my market has changed a little bit in that our Australian Australian listeners are starting to outnumber our American listeners now, which is a good I Okay. Yeah, and that, and that's what we want as well, I guess, just to have our voices heard out there. Um, I'm looking at um, the cover of some of your books now, and I'm looking at our rugby hero now. When I started this interview, my favourite was holding out for a hero because I just couldn't resist that title. Aren't we all mm-hmm. holding out for a hero? Then mm-hmm. I read that Jake, the hero of that, was one of your favourites as well. Yes, that's actually another. Um, well, it's not really. A sports romance per se. It's a single or more of a single title romance, but it's got a huge sporting element in it as well. Uh, and yeah, I, it was actually it was one of the first single title um, books that I wrote. Uh, that was took probably seven or so years to actually get a publisher for it um but I kept sort of persisting with it and persisting with it and it actually was up for a ruby the year before last and it won a um an ARA award as best contemporary romance as well um I loved I loved Jake and um Jake and Ella they've they've been around with me for a long time and um whilst it's set in Brisbane and a lot of my books are set in Brisbane it's you know they both come from a small town out sort of out in west western Queensland and I've um 
you know, I kind of I grew up in central Queensland. I've you know travelled extensively um, around Australia, and um, I really felt um, I call those kind of books of mine urban. Um, um, we're going to get the the terminology wrong now. <laughs> um, it'll come to me in a moment. <laughs> Uh, but to me, it's, they're very much like small town romances. They're yes, they're in a city, but they're um, so they have that urban feel to them. But they have a, at their heart a very small town romance feel, like really a community feel to them. The um, the friends that the family, urban family, that's what I call it. It's like it's the it's like I don't know if you ever saw the television series Friends. You know, none of those people are really related. Well, there's you know, there's a sister and a brother. Um, but they're the they're you know the family that you have in the city. They're not related, but they're the ones that you you know you kind of hang out with and you go to, and you know the ones that you love. So, uh, holding out for a hero and risky business, um, both of sort of my two single titles that are out there um, are very much urban family, and at heart are all about community. And um, I'm just looking at um, the time here and I've done it to you again, so if you're okay with talking for a little bit longer, that would be fantastic. Uh, I'm I'm (laughs) focused... You've got nothing better to do on a beautiful Sunday in Brisbane. Uh, Yeah, um, uh, Amy's touched on so many things there about um, tapping into that sense of community. Uh, As a romance reader, it's what I like the best. We all live such busy lives now and we want to be part of that community. When you're thinking about your readers, uh, do you build that in a very deliberate way? Do I build communities for them yeah. to read? Do you mean? Yeah, yeah, that seems. To um, I, I guess in a way, I'm not really thinking about readers when I do it. I guess I'm thinking about what I like to read when I do it. Like one of my formative influences has really been um, Jennifer Cruzy, who's an who's an American um, author. And prior to my reading her for her book, when I first read her first the first book of hers I read, um, I had been reading romance-wise almost exclusively Harlequin Mills and Boone, um, Sexy Line, so lots of, you know, princes, sheiks, you know, kind of boss secretary. That's kind of the 1980s when I started to, you know, like take my mother's romance novels and read them. So I had a very kind of English focus. And then I actually read um, a book, called Getting Rid of Bradley by Jennifer Cruzy. And it was like this whole different world opened up to me. I didn't realise that romance could actually be like that as well. It was, you know, that that category romance could be like that. And then she went on to have a single title career. And I, lo- I loved in her books is how um, they're all about, you know, community. Um, mostly they're female-centric communities as well, which I really love. So, and I knew I wanted to write like that as soon as I read her I was like this is what I want to write like I want to be you know this is the kind of stuff that I just loved so much so I I guess I actually write that for my my I don't deliberately set out to do it but that's what I enjoy and that's just always was what I'm, is what's in my head I'm thinking there's a level I have in my head at the moment that's um kind of sort of rural, rural romance but it's really going to be more small town romance and already you know, even if I only start out to have a few characters, I always end up having like side characters who actually take on a, on a much more, a much bigger role. Like in Holding Out for a Hero, one of the side characters in that, Pete, who's like um, just like a kind of almost like a comic relief sidekick bartender. Uh, and that was all he was ever going to be, actually became quite um, a big part in that book. And that had that was not planned to begin with. So I do tend to the communities evolve. They don't I don't really necessarily start out that way, but they sort of evolve. I think because that's what I love so much about um, books and romance novels, and then you know that sort of style of writing. Yeah, and um, just so it's very clear here, everyone, uh, Amy is a pantser. Uh, she plots her stories for a little bit, but then um, her imagination takes over and she doesn't quite know where she's going to end up. At least that's what I read. Uh, I think that's a pretty good description. Probably, if you've read it, I probably said it somewhere along <laughs> the way. Um, I'm not a total pantser. Like, there are people who literally just have the two characters and go, although I have done that, I tend to want to have some kind of a loose outline and it works best for me if mostly before I start a book, I've actually been thinking about it quite a lot in my head. Sometimes 
for years or other times for, you know, weeks or months. So I have some idea of the characters. Um, I do kind of have like usually have paper beside me as I'm writing and I'll usually have a chapter outline so I'll kind of know how many chapters ish I want in the book I'll kind of know along the way where I want things to go uh but that's it (laughs) and then I kind of write I probably don't need it I probably could just write but I feel like if I have it then if I get off track if I get lost I've got something to come back to and go oh okay I've still got to do that or or that's what I wanted to happen so it can kind of get me it's more like a security blanket than anything really useful but it's it's just you know <laughs> it's my process so yeah and we're and we're all different when it comes to that but one of the um, common threads that comes through in all these interviews is that successful authors work very, very hard. So if anyone out there thinks they're going to give up their day job and become a writer and have days of leisure, it's not actually <laughs> the case. These guys work longer and harder than the rest of us, um, all except school past teachers. Past midnight. Yeah, yeah past midnight. Um, I think I had emails from two other writers at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so the fact is that I was reading them at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, which is a bit <laughs> scary as well. Uh, what's next for Amy Andrews? Well, I've got five more books in the rugby series that I have to write. So that'll pretty much be next year um, taken up. I'm also doing um, I'm doing a uh, an Australian firefight uh, um, dude book for Thule with um, three other writers. And I'm also doing a professional bull rider as a PBR book for Thule as well. Um, that's all coming up sort of uh, next next year I'm writing another medical romance um, for Harlequin at the end of the year as well so my next 18 months is pretty much <laughs> planned I'm trying to work out how I'm going to fit that all in actually I keep saying every year I'm going to write less books but <laughs> never seems to I never seem to never seems to work that way so yeah. interesting and and romance writers uh it comes out in Hugh Howley's stats which is data guy or um the fellow yep. that does it with him romance writers are one of the few genres where people are making a I say a good living and I don't want to know what you earn or anything um but you can make a living writing yeah I um Gave up my day job or slash night job um, officially um, 2014. Um, I've been retire- retired, a retired nurse for about a year now. Um, and I'm, yeah, I make a livable income. So I've been writing for, I've been, I've been uh, contracted, so earning money from writing for about 12 years. Uh, and but it's really only been the last few years that I would be making what I would call a livable income, um, and I'm very lucky, and I know that because I know there are many writers out there that uh, I think the average, the stat in Australia for authors is about twelve thousand dollars a year earnings. Um, so, you know, I'm really lucky to be earning more than that and to be able to, you know, quit my job and, you know, still be able to pay the mortgage and all that kind of thing, put two kids through various things that they're doing at the moment and stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, but, you know, obviously above me there are people that are earning like, you know, double what I'm earning or triple or, you know, millions of dollars and um, – and then sort of below me, there is a bunch of people earning not much at all. So um, it's nice to be where I am <laughs> as opposed to where I was. I think my very first royalty check ever was like, I don't know, like $86 or something like that. But it snowballed from there. So, And the thing with having such a large back catalogue as I do is that generally speaking, particularly all my Harlequin titles there, you know, and I have lots of Harlequin translations, they're always ticking over and earning money each one. So... Yeah, it's nice to be. It's nice to be me. Nice to be in this position. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm wondering whether that um, statistic of writers earning twelve thousand dollars a year. I'm wondering where, whether how, or sorry, how current that still is, because indie authors um, seem to be turning that figure on its head as well. Um, there seems to be lots of innovative ways to to get your income. I guess, growing, and, and that backlist is a good one. Um, they reckon the best um, 
way to make money out of your first book is to write your second book. There seems to be so much advice out there. Um, mm. I can see why you would stick with traditional publishing because it frees up your time just to focus on what you know and love the best, which is writing. Well, not really because I still have to do a lot of, you know, social media stuff as well. Like I literally the first part of my day is spent on doing – you know, Facebook and Twitter and if I'm, you know, guest blogging somewhere or doing, you know, a book tour or so, you know, yes, there are lots, a lot of things that you don't necessarily have to worry about. Um, but also, you know, publishers still demand that you do a fair bit of that as well. So that all takes up time. Um, I'd like to just be able to, you know, write and do nothing else. That would be, that would be great. Um, but I, you know, I think particularly with romance authors, the readers are really, um, you know, passionate about connecting with you as the author. They want to know about you and your life and, you know, they're really connected to the characters that you write and they really want to have a relationship, you know, albeit, uh, you know, and sort of almost sort of fake one online, but, you know, they like to feel that they know you and that, you know, you care about them and that you feel close. So, um, nurturing that takes a lot of time as well so it's not just all about I think more and more um traditionally public traditional published authors are having more um you know stuff asked of them as well so and I I, like I said I really consider myself a hybrid I'm with you know with Harlequin and I have traditionally published books but both Thule and Entangled are digital only publishers so um there's a lot of online stuff to do with them as well so Yes. Um, I noticed you were talking about my um, my manga translations. I've actually got one here. I wonder if I can show you what it looks like. I'm not very good with camera, my camera work. Oh, it's so, beautiful. That, uh, we'll put the screenshot. That is absolutely good. It is. It's a manga character from the boys I see at school in a romance novel. It is yeah, gorgeous. And then there's the drawings inside with the, um, you know, the Japanese you can see these are absolutely beautiful books the the cover is gorgeous and it's just everything about it is absolutely beautiful mangas are like one of those translations that uh, all Harlequin authors desperately desperately want and it took me I've only just started to have manga translations in the last couple of years I've only got about I think four or five of my books out of my you know 40 Harlequin books that have gone into manga Uh, a lot of the um like say sexy line authors, most of their books would be in manga. So it's um it's quite a novelty for me to have some mangas, and I love and you know you get one copy and people say, oh can I have it? I'm like, no, <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> yeah. This is a trend that I know absolutely nothing about, but Amy is holding up this amazing graphic novel. Now, I know in the schools that kids love their graphic novels and they love their manga and I can put it up on YouTube and they get very excited. This is the first time I've seen a romance novel and, as you said, the Mm. sexy romance novels are taking off. My mind just boggles. Amy, I didn't see a whole lot of words in there and an awful lot of pictures. There's lots of pictures, not many words, and clearly I can't speak Japanese, so I don't know. But it's actually quite amazing, like, you know, knowing what this particular book is. I can look at the there's some of these pictures and go, oh, that's that scene. That's that scene that I wrote. They're actually really quite amazing. It's like, well, that's a scene where she fell overboard and she rescued the child and it's all there, and it, you know, in pictures. So it's just fa- – it's really fascinating. It's just awesome. I am going to look into this subject further, everybody. It – I, as I said, the mind boggles, um, and especially when you get to some of the subject matter and some of the illustrations that must come out of it. But as I said, I've only come across this with teenagers. It's the first time that I've heard that adults read manga. Well, uh, obviously they do, like, you know, in Asian countries. I've got Japanese translations as well that aren't, uh, you know, all words, no no pictures. And I have a, I've got a... Korean one is a Korean translation as well, which is, again, um, all words. And Harlequin also do Harlequin comics, which are, are like the manga. They've got the pictures, but they're actually all in English, like the words are all in English. So I've got quite a few of those out as well. Um, so it's obviously popular. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I suppose maybe it's the um, YA, NA, you know, young adult, new adult audience that are reading the comics. I don't know. 
But yeah, it's you know that's, this book is my jellyfish book, right? This manga is what it's um, like. It's called Greek Doctor Cinderella Bride or something like that, and I've always called it my jellyfish book because it's set up uh, in North Queensland at a jellyfish research um, uh, station, and you can see look. You can see the jellyfish there. Can you see that jellyfish? I can. Yeah. Amy's, the box jellyfish. Amy's holding up some How of the pictures in this. It's um, just... Yes, and I, I'll take some screenshots, I think, and I'll, I'll put them up on Facebook so some of us can have a look at these. Um, mm. Harlequin Comics um, just blows me away. Mm. I think if there's, me any, away too. Yeah, if there's any manga illustrators out there, please get in touch with me. Um, I've got a couple of kids' books that I'd love to see translated into manga. Um, and it's maybe the future direction because, as we all know, you know, things are becoming more and more visual. And mm. that's what I, I know that a lot of in Japan, because it's on my royalty statements, um, you, they can actually download digital like onto their mobile devices, digital manga stuff. I have that available in Japan as well through the Harlequin Japan, you know, um, website as well. So they can get it digitally on their phone also, which kind of blows my brain. (laughs) Yeah, and one of the figures I heard from Joanna Penn, who's um, my indie, indie publishing guru, is that even in India, Everybody is reading on their mobile devices and mm. kids, everyone has a mobile device. They're very, very cheap over there. Mm. Um, the world will just explode, I guess, with this kind of stuff. And it'll be very interesting to see if the authors make much money out of it. But I can certainly see some potential Um I did want to talk Mm. with Amy today about um, putting our readers at the centre of um, our author experience and she's done that well and truly without even meaning to. I'm guessing, Amy, that you and I will both have a bit of a chuckle where we see um, what direction this goes in from here. Yeah, I think it's probably just beginning. It'll be interesting to see. I was reading an article in a science magazine my husband um, subscribes to before and about... um, um, AI, artificial intelligence, having like little home um, bot thing, you know, that can switch your lights on and do all that kind of thing. But how that's just the beginning, how Pokemon Go is just the beginning of what will be an explosion in that kind of, you know, gaming and stuff. It's actually very, you know, primitive technology compared to, you know, what will, I mean, at the moment it's, you know, it's just shiz, everybody loves it, um, but it's actually going to be, what we're going to have in, you know, two, three, ten years' time is going to be, you know, so much better oh. than that. Yeah, I think we, um, we, we've we been exploring a little bit the um, termino- terminology of augmented reality as opposed to um, the old virtual reality. Um, and now we've got our, um, our manga illustrations coming up and our things. But I did notice, and this will be my last one, I promise, I did Sweet. notice that you're still doing the old um, blog tours, the the blog posts, the guest posting and all that kind of stuff. I've got to admit that I moved on from that very, very quickly because I got lazy and it was exhausting. Mm. Um, but as you said, your readers want it, so you have to still put that at the centre. Well, I... Entangled particularly um, really pushed to do blog tours with their authors. So, and compared to the first ones I did a few years ago, they're not as exhausting. My, a lot of blog tours now just want an excerpt, you know, and so you're not actually necessarily writing blogs for all of them. So it's a little, and because there's so many places offering blog tours now, and, you know, it's a way for bloggers to monetize their you know, their, their blogs and um, I, and I, I, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how effective they are really to sell books, but my publisher, you know, wants me to do it. So I do it. Um, I probably wouldn't do it if, um, you know, if I decided to self-publish something, I wouldn't go and, and book a blog tour because you're right, it takes, it's a lot of time uh, writing blogs, organising it all, um, it costs money, you know, there's all these kind of different things to consider. Um, yeah, blog tours uh, certainly exploded in the last few years, that's for sure. And I think if you're going to book a blog tour, then it's got to be quite targeted, you know, you I think you need to be clever about which one you choose and why. And if I was doing it as from an indie point of view for, for a self-published book, I would 
I would choose um, a review tour. Like only do blogs run, I'm going to get a review as well. They'll post on Amazon, and you know, so you kind of get a double whammy from it. You get, you know, there's two advantages to it. You'll get exposure on that blog site. But you should also get a review, you know, whatever, good or bad, whatever, whatever the review is, the review is, but at least you're getting something else for it as well. Yeah, and reviews are something that keep coming up time and time again, whether it be for my podcast or for reviews on Amazon for books. It's what people use, those testimonials, to um, mm. wonder whether they're going to buy it as well. It's it's a complicated world out there, Amy, and it makes my head spin. Um, no, <laughs> I'm I'm following uh, Joanne Dannon a little bit um, because she just does my head in with all the stuff that she's doing with Facebook and um, looking at um, what do you call it the analytics and all that kind of stuff. And I just mm. sit here. I like talking to people. I get to talk to all of you. And someone came on my um, website the other day and he said, "Look, I've got my wallet out, but there's nowhere to spend any money." And I'm going, oh, "I'll get to that. Get to that later." <laughs> <laughs> you need to monetize. You need to monetize. That's, I keep hearing. <laughs> I know that. people say to me, like, "Why aren't you on?" Am- why don't you got an Amazon affiliate on your website? You could make some money. I'm like, oh, it's just too hard. I don't know. It's too – I just want to write. <laughs> I really w- – I do – I don't have much of a head for that kind of thing either. So all that thing is a bit of a struggle. I would love to be able to, you know, afford to have an assistant for a few days a week and and just say to them, okay, monetize my website. Okay, um up for about the last five years, I keep saying, I must get a wiki romance page up on me because, you know, there's wiki romance and, you know, lots of authors have their things up. Like, I should do one for me. And then I think, oh, yes, I've got a list of things that you know, if I had a, an assistant, I would just go, do all that for me because I just don't have time. And then when I'm having downtime, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to spend my nights writing wiki romance pages about myself. You know, I want to relax with a glass of wine from the television and watch something good. So um, trying to get a work-life balance when you work from home, as you know, um, is hard because the temptation is always just to be at your computer doing stuff, you know, for work. And I try – all this year I was supposed to not work weekends at all. Well, that hasn't worked out one little bit. Most weekends I'm writing. So I'm really determined <laughs> – next year to organize myself so that I'm only writing during the week and maybe work on my manuscript. I've got a bit of a manuscript assessment business. Do that on the weekends if there's a manuscript to do. But other than that, just, you know, not write. (laughs) Read even. Read. Goodness. That's Um, a double C. I'm finding um, the social media thing is overwhelming I've uh, I'm a recent convert to social media and um, look it's been good I've made some I feel like I found my tribe with you guys and I actually get back to where I was pre-marriage and kids and all that kind of stuff so it's an excellent way of me reconnecting with with who I am and who I want to be with but my daughter keeps saying to me mummy you're on your phone again mummy you're on your phone again I say, I'm working darling leave me alone but really it's an intrusive thing that you never put down Yes, it's always yeah, it's always with you. That's exactly right. You carry you with your phone. You've got a computer in your pocket or your bag, essentially, or your hand mostly. Um, and it's hard to. It's quite yeah, it's quite addictive, really. You know, I as far as Facebook goes, I try to post on my page. Um, oh, I post every day. I you know twice a day is my kind of what I like to do. I find I get more um, hits or whatever reaches in the morning than I do in the afternoon, but I still try to post twice a day. Um, I've, but I'm, I'm quite bad at it in ways because I try, I really do avoid looking at my news feed because <sighs> some of the stuff that people put up make me really angry. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like that turns away in my gut all day and um, I, I, I try very hard to be apolitical on, you know, my Amy Andrews page is just me and books and, you know, it's not about what I believe in politically or so I, I don't put anything on that. And for anybody who knows me personally, they know how hard that is for me. They know I'm not, I'm a very political person so it's very hard for me not to be that person and not to comment on anybody else's po- posts as Amy Andrews, you know, on that. And so I find actually that 
Facebook, <laughs> if I look at to if I look at my news feed, I know I'm just going to be something. Somebody's going to say something. It's just going to make me really cranky, and then I'm actually in a really bad frame of mind to be writing because that will be turning away. I mean, it's a bit like learning that your book's on a pirate site, and all that does is make me <laughs> just really cranky and angry, and I'm like then I'm in this really bad space to have to then sit down and write something I can't. So I actually rather not know. I'd rather just not go, okay, well, my books are on pirate sites everywhere. All right, well, there's nothing I can do about it. There are things I can do about it, but that makes me angry. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to not go there. I'm just going to accept that that happens and do what I can for the people who actually want to buy my books. So, yeah. yeah. And I think I think that's um, I only found out about pirated sites again through probably through social media, and I found out that the politics that goes on in Facebook really quite shocks me at times. And I'm I'm just going, get a life, <laughs> go go out there and do something interesting. Um, and the photos that I seem to be attracted to all the time are beaches, and we have a couple of people who put up pictures of beaches just to make me restless um, on a regular basis. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do love a beach shot. I do love the water. I'd love to live, but I'd love, love to live the beach. I mean, my ultimate goal is to to move to somewhere where I haven't. I mean, I don't I like. I don't like swimming in the ocean or anything. Like you know, because I don't like swimming in anything. You can't see what's swimming around you. Like, but I like looking at the ocean, and I love the the noise, the sound of waves on the beach. I find it incredibly just well filling. So. Um, I would like to live by the beach, not to swim, just to look. <laughs> yeah, and and look, that's the romance in all of romantic in all of us. We we love that idea of sitting on our deck. I'm going to finish. I'm going to wind up now with that image. It is um, ten o'clock in the morning. No, it's a, oh, it's eleven thirty in the morning here, <laughs> but <laughs> it's five o'clock somewhere, and you could kick back with a glass of wine, watching the waves go by. Um, I know that, and Amy finishes her day sometimes with a nice glass of wine perhaps looking at looking out at the mountains maybe oh yes i have got a mountain view but i'm actually doing a 30-day booze free uh at the moment before conference um so although i did go out last night and have a couple of glasses of wine i must admit i've probably cheated a few times in that 30 days but um i am trying because conference is a big social <laughs> wine drinking event for like five interminable days because I get always get there on the Wednesday and leave on the Monday. So I try to, you know, be kind to my liver before I go. <laughs> yeah, and everybody, that conference will be absolutely wonderful. If you're anywhere in the vicinity of Adelaide, Australia, uh, later on this month, make sure that you pop in and say hello to some of the yeah, girls. Yeah, it's two weeks. It's two weeks this weekend and there's a big book signing that's on, um, on the Saturday, which is the – what date's that? That's the 20th. Um, yeah, if anybody's in Adelaide or around Adelaide and they want to come see a bunch of romance authors and um, try some of my books, there's a massive book signing going on in the afternoon at the uh, Hotel in Glenelg, which is the uh, – I can't think of what it is. I can't remember, but it's at Glenelg, yeah. yeah. So, and Adelaide's yeah. a beautiful city. It's um, the City of the Roses. It's got the beautiful old sandstone buildings. Um, I might try and get one of you back on to give us a bit of a debrief on that conference. Um, there will be, as I said, there will be editors and agents there. There will be tips and tricks that we can pick up on. I'm sure there'll be a, a large indie um, author contingent because I know we've got some pretty good indie authors um, here in Australia. Um, Amy, keep your ears and eyes peeled for us um, before five o'clock and have <laughs> a fantastic time. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right. I, look, it's always a load of fun. I'll put some of those manga um, pictures up because I think we all want to know a little bit more about them. Um, Amy, we shall speak again. Okay. Thanks, Melinda. Okay. Thank you.